Um, so first off, I just wanted to thank you all for being with me here today, right before lunchtime. I know that's a big ask, so thank you very much. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started now. There was a theory in linguistics called the superior work hypothesis, which I find very charming. So charming, in fact, the screens have decided to go off again. Hold on. with this technology. Um, as I was saying, there is a theory in linguistics called the sapir whorf hypothesis, which I find extremely charming. The sapir whorf hypothesis says this. The language that we speak, like English or Mandarin or Igbo, and the terms and concepts available in that language directly influence our ability to think. The strong version of that hypothesis is what we can say in a language determines what we can think. Language determines thought. This extreme hypothesis has been debunked, but the softer version of the hypothesis remains accepted by many modern linguists. They call that version language influences thought. I call it words have power. This talk is about the power of words to shape our reality, and in particular, the power of the word technical. So who am I, and why am I standing up here in front of you giving this speech? Hi, I'm Megna. That's me in the upper left-hand corner. In some ways, I've been involved in technology for most of my life. In middle school and high school, I was on the robotics team. I was part of a girls in technology club, which played around the Piper car. I've taken a few computer science classes. I spent three months studying basic hardware and electronics. And recently I spent 12 weeks where I coded every day. So holding it doesn't work, is what we've learned. Okay, all right. We'll try this. My experience is specific to me. So while I'm pretty sure what I want to talk to you about today applies more broadly, at least within the United States, I will be bringing with me my own limitations and biases. I ask for your patience, and I'll be inviting all of you to share your own experiences and thoughts. So this is me, and my experience. And yet, I do not feel qualified to give this talk. In fact, because you should always be truthful in front of a room full of strangers, I kind of feel like a fraud. Because I don't really know if I am technical. And I think that's really interesting, because yes, if this was a job interview for a back-end systems architect, then I would be a fraud. But it's not. This is a talk given to a bunch of people who love making things and being creative with code, which are two things I also love and I work really hard at. In some ways, you are all the ideal audience. So what gives? I think it has a lot to do with how loaded the word technical is. All right, I'm gonna ask you all a question and I'd like you to answer honestly. Should I just ditch the slides? Okay, hands up, aye. Okay, nay. Keeping the slides. All right, here we go. <laughs> all right, so to continue, I wanna walk you through a little bit, uh, a couple of definitions of the word technical. This is, the word technical from a historical perspective comes from the Greek. It comes from two words, techne and logos. Techne is the art, skill, craft, or the way or the manner in which a thing is gained. Ah, let's see if we have some help. Okay. As I was saying, crossing our fingers here, um, techne is the art, craft, or manner by which a thing is gained. Logos, which is the second part of that, is the word, the utterance by which inward thought is expressed, a saying, or an expression. I think that is beautiful, I think that is totally poetic, and I think that's not what we're looking for here. This is the current definition of the word technical, relating to a particular subject, art, or craft, or its techniques, 
technical terms of involving or concerned with applied industrial sciences, an important technical achievement. This is closer, but somehow still doesn't quite capture the modern use of the term. It doesn't explain this. If technical means relating to a particular subject or its techniques, how can that also be applied to a person? There is some meaning or modern usage of the word that is not being captured by the dictionary. usage of the term technical has become a fixed identity. You are technical or you are non-technical. The word technical also carries with it the same prejudices that the mathematic and scientific ability do, at least within the United States. But there's no universally agreed upon definition of what that means. It becomes a double-edged sword. The word technical has meaning only in the context of the person using the term. And that's a problem. Two stories. In my old job, as a designer, we were deciding who would work on a project. It was an exciting opportunity involving a client's data science team. A name was proposed for one of the designers, but the consensus was that the project needed someone more technical. Has anyone heard of or been a part of a similar discussion? You can feel free to raise your hands or shout at me. Cool, yeah. This is the first edge of technical as a fixed identity, when a standard is being applied to you. Nowhere in that conversation was there an explicit discussion of what specific skills or experience were needed for that role. Instead, a decision was made based off of the vague feelings of a group of people. There was a sniff test. All right, let's give that a go. as a fixed identity. When the word is used in that kind of context, it picks up the biases, the history, and the intent of the speaker. When that speaker is a person in a position of power, a professor, an employer, a manager, it can serve as a standard that is impossible to meet because it is impossible to define. At the very least, it's sloppy language. And at the worst, it can be deliberately malicious and intended to bar people from entry. In the second case, that second edge, technical as a fixed identity is a standard that you apply to yourself. How many of you have had someone say to you, oh, I'm just not that technical, when faced with a challenge, or worse, with an opportunity? If technical has no true definition, how can we know if we're technical? We look at the associated traits that society tells us go along with being technical. I walked away from computer science in college. Not because I didn't like it, not because I was bad at it, but because I thought I wasn't good enough. There can be a distinct machismo that comes with programming. And while anyone can perpetuate that kind of behavior, I use the machi word machismo intentionally because it's not something that I've encountered in femme-centric technology spaces. It's the machismo that says, people should spring fully formed into the world running on Linux, and that the tools you use define who you are, and that for real programmers, programming is easy. You are or you aren't. I thought I was didn't have that type of brain. I wasn't technical enough. So I walked away. And for seven years, I didn't code a damn thing. 
And that makes me angry. It makes me angry that I fell for that. But it also makes me sad. Because think about how much more I would know if I would spent those seven years learning and trying and failing, but mostly growing.
The world of programming remains narrow, restricted to people that society has always told are technical. And that is certainly not representative of our population. But technology infiltrates every aspect of our society. And when the control and shaping of that technical infrastructure, the awareness of the implications of technology remains restricted to a small population, it leaves us much, much more vulnerable. I think sometimes about the position we're in regarding surveillance and facial recognition, and that question, how the situation might be different if people of color, specifically black folks and other communities with a history of being surveilled, were proportionally represented within the technology industry. I don't think we would be in the same place. Okay, switching gears a little bit. I've talked about the effect of technology's fixed mindset. I now want to dive into a little bit of the science behind that, which means we're going to take a brief digression into one of my favorite topics, cognitive psychology. You're all super stoked. <laughs> this is Carol Black. She's most famous for giving children math problems that they couldn't solve. I very much identify with the young lady on the far right. Here's how it went down. Experimenters took two groups of children and gave them math problems literally beyond their abilities. That sounds mean, but honestly, quite a lot of life is like that too. So, eh. Then they took a look at what happened. The children fell into two distinct groups. Group A and Group B. In Group A, children were excited for the challenge. When they got the problem wrong, they were disappointed, but they looked forward to being shown how to do it correctly. They said things like, I'll get it next time, and I love a good challenge. Group B's response was very different. Their stress hormone cortisol spiked. Their brains showed increased stress and anxiety. And in fact, all of this internal noise wiped out their ability to retain the correct answer to the problem when they were shown it. Group B was much more likely to say that in the future they would cheat on a test rather than studying harder. So what was the difference between these two groups? The difference between these groups was how they viewed intelligence. Specifically, whether they believed intelligence was a fixed quantity or something that they could improve. We are all prone to confirmation bias. We look for evidence to confirm our worldviews. So for group A, you get something wrong. You didn't know it. You'll do better next time because you can get better. Group B, get something wrong, and suddenly you're not as smart as you thought you were. In fact, you're not the person you thought you were. And now all of a sudden, one single math problem has turned into a fundamental threat to your identity. That is extraordinarily stressful. Much more stressful than a simple math problem. Okay, so what does that have to do with my talk? Replace math problems with coding challenge questions. When we view technical ability as a fixed identity, we fall into the same patterns of fixed and growth mindset. Children with a fixed mindset towards intelligence are more likely to walk away from challenges or difficulties towards things that will confirm their abilities. They will either deliberately choose tasks that are so easy they know they'll succeed, or tasks that are so difficult that their failure can't be held against them. Children with growth mindsets are more likely to seek out opportunities that challenge them and promote continual learning. I want you to think about that. So while the capabilities of any two students may be very similar on a given day, think about the ramifications of those choices spread out over a lifetime. The point is not that the growth mindset children were somehow better than the children with a fixed mindset. It's not even that you're either one or the other. We're both, we're all a mixture of both. You may change over time, and you may be fixed in some areas, and you may be growth in others. That I'm here giving this talk is only an example of the intense effort I've made over the last few years to change my mindset. The point is that the way we teach, engage, and learn shape our attitudes towards failure and difficulty. And I would argue 
that many traditional coding environments and schools in the United States reinforce the view of technical as a fixed identity. So, in the United States, in traditional schooling environments, computer science majors, 80% of those majors go to men and 20% to women. I'm going to talk about gender here because it's easier to draw an analogy internationally than it is to draw an analogy between the racial makeup of the United States and those abroad. So 80% to 20%. And that is a percentage that has declined over time, not increased. Now in India, men get 55% of the CS degrees, and women get 45% while making up 48% of the population. Here's a quote from a study on technical views and mindsets in India. Female students believe that the typical computing culture consists of dedicated, hardworking, intelligent, and meticulous students. Female students believe CS to be a field in which women could excel. Indian women do not feel that teachers neglect them in mathematics and computing classes. From early on, female students were taught to invest in hard work, which is seen to solve scientific and technical problems, and thus a requirement to succeed in life. I do not believe that the difference between 20% and 45% is something that can be explained by gender. The problem is not that individuals who are underrepresented in technology have the wrong mindset to succeed. It's that the technical environments we have for learning remain gendered and racialized. This should probably be part of a separate talk, but I'm up here. As computer science becomes a more sought after major, a capped major at many universities and institutions, the requirements for studying it rise. And that sends the message that if you haven't been coding since you were a child, you don't belong. An interesting fact is that coding boot camps have a lot more women. In 2017, studies showed that about 40% of boot campers who graduated were women. And over time, that representation has only increased. And I think there's a reason for that. Boot camps have a vested interest in convincing everyone that they have the ability to code. Universities don't. What I can do and you can do, is ensure that in our workplaces, in our communities, and perhaps most importantly, within ourselves, we develop and encourage a growth mindset towards being technical. That's what I want to focus on and discuss with you for the rest of this talk. Or being smarter than everyone else, 
The rule is work. To me, that perfectly sums up a growth mindset. Of course, these are principles, and it's worth asking whether they show up in practice in both of these organizations. I believe that they do, and that they embody several other important practices as well. I want to share some of those with you, which I believe are core to creating an environment with a growth mindset. Everyone is a teacher. In both of these places, students come from backgrounds in art, in technology, in dance, in community organizing. Some of them have degrees in computer science. Some of them write their very first for loop on the second day. In other places, having such a wide range of experience could turn toxic. It could bore those familiar with the subject and intimidate those who are just starting out. Instead, that range becomes a positive part of the experience. And I believe that's because these schools do something that not all traditional environments do. They emphasize the value of teaching as much as the value of learning or doing. So everyone becomes a teacher. Marcus taught us dance moves. Netta taught us how to think critically. I showed people how to make breakfast potatoes, and none of those things were more or less. We all had something to give, Therefore, we all had something of value. When we believe we have something to share, we become much more willing to admit our own vulnerability, which is a key part of the growth mindset. Of course, in order to do that, we need to make sure that success is not dependent on other people's failures. For a lot of people, this goes contrary to the notion of success. Success for many people is winning, being better than. But when we are in competition for value, we cannot show vulnerability or weakness that is essential to growth. I know this may seem obvious, but think of the environments that you're a part of, especially the professional ones. How often are promotions given based on how giving and excellent a collaborator and a contributor someone is? How good they make other people? Rarely, and if you have one, come talk to me. Number two. Be relevant over being precise. My favorite social rule at the Recur Center is the one that says, no, well, actually, well, actually, is according to my dear friend, Alona Brand, are a minor but intrusive correction, which aren't necessary or helpful in the context of the overall conversation. How many of you have been well actually? How many of you have well actually someone else? It's an instinct. It happens. We can get so excited about knowing something that we take someone else's moment of learning or exploration and make it all about us. But I think that rule embodies a deeper principle as well. There are many roads to understanding, and the ones that work for us are determined by our personal histories and experience. When I'm learning something new, I think about it as trying on metaphor shoes. Because I have a background in theater and in psychology, those are the shoes that come out first. So you're telling me that a protocol is kind of like a script? There are a range of things that person A can say to which person B knows the response, and you agreed on those things ahead of time. No? Not quite. It's like a synapse where an electrical signal is converted into a chemical one, and then back into electrical based on a set of rules? No. Not quite that? Well, what about... None of those things are precise or accurate. You could well actually the crap out of me. Please don't. But they're super important because they represent my attempt to make a technical concept relevant to something that I know. Oftentimes we can get so hung up on the right way of understanding something or the exact and precise definition that we don't notice whether the person we're speaking with has any experiential basis or understanding for it at all. So it is totally cool to try and understand merge sort algorithms based on folding your own laundry, or binary trees based on choose your own adventure games. Concepts that we cannot relate to our direct experience are harder to understand. Mental metaphors and similes can serve as the bridge between an old concept and a new one. Be relevant first, be precise later. Showing the scratch paper. Technical as a fixed identity obscures the time and effort that it takes to get good at something. Because it treats technical as an innate capability. 
Therefore, people must protect that superiority at all costs. A way to combat that is to be transparent about how long it takes to learn things and to share your personal journey. This is not a dramatic class. I really just need water. possible for me 
unless I've moved away from technical as a fixed identity towards technical as a growth mindset. So as we come up on our time here, I want to propose to you a new definition of being technical. Because the point of this talk is that words have power, but also that we have the ability to choose our own definitions. All right, here's my first attempt, a rough draft, of what being technical might mean. Being technical is having the mindset that you can master any subject if you spend enough time learning and practicing its underlying structures, mechanisms, and dimensions. All right, it sounds good, but what do I mean by structures, mechanisms, and dimensions? I do have an answer for you. When I think about structures, from the coding perspective, I may think about data structures, lists, trees, tables, different ways of representing information. But when I think about it in terms of narrative, you might think of short stories, novels, or plays. You might have the same content within any of that frame, but the impact becomes very different, and the powers and abilities it has becomes very distinct based on the form that you choose. Mechanisms. I think of these kind of like techniques. So in programming, for loops and while loops let you control the flow of a program. That's a mechanism. In narrative, point of view, flashbacks, in art, cross-hatching, or different perspectives. These are all techniques. In dimensions, which I think are kind of as the heart of any medium, in code, I might think of them as abstraction as one dimension, and mutability as another. In painting, I might think of value, color, and form. True mastery will take as much time as you are willing to put in, but being technical isn't about getting a certain percentage of these concepts or knowing more than anyone else. It's believing that if you set your mind to it, you can work it out, and then it's putting in the work. And what I like about this definition is that when you look at technical this way, suddenly a lot more things in life start to look technical. We are all totally 